Hi. So in today's video, we're discussing the three-dimensional structure of proteins. If you recall from our last video, we had discussed the primary structure of proteins and the various amino acids that make up these proteins. Now we will focus on how both non-covalent and covalent forces, along with the functional groups of the R groups on amino acids, can drive a protein structure. We will actually spend two class meetings on activities pertaining to this chapter. So fortunately, you guys only have to watch one video for this unit and we can catch a little break. I would probably suggest, however, um, to use this extra time to brush up on learning how to identify your amino acids based on their structures and memorizing their three letter abbreviations. Um, for those of you going on to med school and taking the MCAT, I will say that um, sometimes the one letter abbreviation does show up, so you may want to work on memorizing that as well. But for the purposes of the class, we just need to know the three letter abbreviation. Now, in our first meeting, um, we'll be working on activity S3 from the workbook in order to gain a visual perspective on a common secondary structure in proteins, the alpha helix. We will also get to compare and contrast um, various two-dimensional model representations of proteins, such as stick, ribbon, and space filling models. And we'll get to observe how the R groups of amino acids are distributed along an alpha helix. Then in our second meeting, um, building up from our first meeting, we'll work on activity S4, which is the 3D structure of proteins, in which we'll actually get to construct a three-dimensional model of an alpha helix in order to gain a deeper perspective on how various forces stabilize the different levels of protein structure and begin to elucidate and describe the thermodynamic factors that direct and stabilize 3D structures. As usual, here are your learning objectives for this chapter, so be sure to pause, read over these, and keep them in the back of your mind as we continue through the lecture. So, in terms of protein structure, there are four different levels of structure. The primary structure, which is the amino acid sequence of the protein, starting with the N-terminus and ending at the C-terminus. The secondary structure, which describes how neighboring amino acids interact through non-covalent forces, such as hydrogen bonding, in order to form structures such as alpha helices or beta pleated sheets. The tertiary structure then describes long-range interactions between amino acids within the same polymer chain that can allow the protein to fold back in on itself. And the quaternary structure describes the interactions between two or more different polymer chains in order to assemble higher order structures. The secondary structure, as I mentioned previously, can be stabilized by hydrogen bonds. But the types of secondary structures that we can form are limited by the planar peptide bond. Because of resonance stabilization about the peptide bond, we have limited torsion angles about the alpha carbon and the amine. The torsion angles about the alpha carbon are called the phi and psi. Due to the planar nature of the peptide bond, as well as steric hindrance with various R groups, we have limited phi and psi angles. We can use these angles to predict secondary structure based on the peptide sequence. The Ramachandran diagram is a plot that can tell you which phi psi angle distributions drive which secondary structures. As we can see here in this diagram, the upper left quadrant has mainly beta pleated sheets and is driven by a phi angle between 0 and 180 with a psi angle between minus 180 to 0. The lower left quadrant, we see more right-handed alpha helices between phi angles of 0 to minus 180 and psi angles of minus 180 to 0. And in the upper right corner, we don't get too many structures except for a left-handed helix um, between phi 0 and 180 and psi 0 and 180. And these are mostly derived by proline, which we'll come back and talk to. Interestingly, the amino acid glycine actually has greater flexibility in its torsion angles because its R group is just a hydrogen. And glycine is not restricted by a bulky R group and has better flexibility. Alternatively, proline with its cyclic R group that contains the alpha amine group from the peptide bond is actually more restricted and is only able to form left-handed alpha helical structures as we see in the upper white quadrant. 
Because of these unique characteristics, we often see proline glycine sequences and tight hairpin-like turns of protein secondary structures, and we'll readdress that in just a minute. As mentioned previously, a common secondary structure is the alpha helix. This structure is described as a helical twist with 3.6 amino acids per turn with a pitch of 5.4 angstroms, a pitch being the distance between turns. We also have an extensive hydrogen bonding network between the carboxyl carbon of one amino acid and the amine of an amino acid four residues downstream. The R groups of the amino acids face outward and downward from the core projected into the bulk solvent, while the backbone makes up the inner core. We will actually spend some time in class looking at both the two-dimensional and three-dimensional models of alpha helices in order to gain a better perspective of this really cool structure. Another common secondary structure is the beta-pleated sheet. This structure is driven by hydrogen bonding between the peptide backbones of neighboring polypeptide chains and can occur in either a parallel, where both chains are oriented in the same direction, or anti-parallel fashion, where they run opposite of each other. In either type, the R group of the amino acids project above or below in alternating sequences on the sheet which is comprised of the backbone. If we look closely at both the antiparallel and parallel structures, we can see that the hydrogen bonding in the antiparallel structure is head on, while the parallel structure, the hydrogen bonds come in at an angle. This makes the antiparallel structure much more stable in comparison. The R groups that are projected either above or below the pleated sheets can also interact with each other in order to further stabilize the structure. A common pattern that we see in pleated sheets is an alternating hydrophilic hydrophobic R group pattern which results in a two-faced pleated sheet as seen here, where the hydrophobic faces of two pleated sheets can come together to shield them from water and the hydrophilic face is happily exposed. Another common secondary structure is the reverse or beta turn in which we have an X proline glycine X, where X is any amino acid, with stabilizing hydrogen bonds between the first and fourth amino acid. I would mentioned this previously, but again, proline lends itself well as the pivot point for this turn because its R group is cyclicized with its alpha amine group, creating a very rigid but very compact structure. While the hydrogen R group of glycine is also compact, it allows glycine to have increased flexibility for the tight turn and also allows space for the two R groups of the terminal amino acids to interact as depicted here. These turns are called beta turns because we often see them as connecting a series of beta pleated sheets. When we look at how secondary structures assemble and interact together, we are now describing the tertiary structure of a protein. Biochemists often describe the tertiary structure of proteins as either fibrous or globular, although we can argue that a number of proteins encompass both categories, it can still be a useful way to describe the overall structure based on which type is dominant. Fibrous proteins such as collagen and alpha keratin tend to contain more helices and typically play structural roles in the cell, while globular proteins tend to have mixed structures of beta pleated sheets, helices, coils, and other unstructured components. A majority of the enzymes in the cell are globular in nature. A textbook example of a fibrous protein is alpha keratin the protein that makes up our hair and nails. However, alpha keratin does deviate slightly from the standard alpha helical structure because it has a pitch of 5.1 angstroms instead of 5.4, meaning it is slightly tighter and more compact of a coil. This occurs due to the stabilizing interactions between two alpha helices that come together to create a coil-coil structure. The primary sequence of alpha keratin contains a seven residue pseudo repeat in which the first and seventh residues contain nonpolar R groups. This repeat allows for the formation of a hydrophobic face at the coil coil interface between two strands. Two coil coil fibers can then assemble with another pair of coils to form what we call a protofilament. Then two protofilaments can further assemble to form a single microfibril. The primary sequence of alpha keratin is also rich in cysteines, which if you remember from chapter 4, this amino acid is able to form a spontaneous covalent bond between other nearby cysteine residues through the thiol R group. 
These cysteine residues can greatly increase the strength of the keratin microfibrils by creating numerous covalent bridges. While the number of cysteine residues in the primary sequence of alpha keratin can vary from individual to individual, we see that individuals with curly hair contain significantly more cysteine residues than individuals with straight hair. Indeed, the method of either heat shocking the hair with a straightening iron in order to disrupt those bonds, or chemically denaturing the cysteine disulfide bridges with a Brazilian blowout is how people can go from curly to straight hair. In the Brazilian blowout example, a reducing agent is used to break the bond between the cysteine residues, and specialized shampoos with trace amounts of the reducing agent, absent from sulfates, which can then compete with the reducing agent, are used to maintain the straightening effect for a longer time. Collagen, the protein found in our skin and blood vessels providing both support and elasticity, is another example of a helical protein. In this structure, we have an assembly of three left-handed helices to form a right-handed triple helix. The left-handed helical structure of each individual strand is derived from the three amino acid repeat of glycine XY, where X is often a proline and Y is often a hydroxylated form of proline or lysine. As an interesting side note, the hydroxylation of these residues requires vitamin C. So when we are deficient in vitamin C, such as in scurvy cases, the filaments and collagen cannot properly form, which results in skin lesions, poor wound healing, fragile blood vessels, and ultimately death. Scurvy was actually a really common ailment for sailors when fresh fruit rich in vitamin C is scarce after a long voyage. The British Navy recognized this connection in the 1700s and began introducing limes to sailors' diets, which resulted in the nickname limey for a British sailor. Because of the predominance of proline and its ring structure R groups, the single helices are forced into a left-handed turn, and upon assembly of the triple helix, glycine, with its very small, non-bulky hydrogen R group, is found buried in the center of the helix. A hydrogen bonding network between the amino hydrogen of each glycine and the carboxyl oxygen of a neighboring chain's proline further stabilizes this tertiary structure. The presence of the inflexible R groups of both the hydroxylated proline and proline amino acids provides a very rigid structure. In globular proteins, we tend to see less specific patterns in amino acid sequence. However, we see that hydrophobic residues tend to be oriented into the core of the tertiary structure, while charged residues are found on the surface of the protein. And uncharged but polar residues can be found either at the surface or in the interior of the protein. As we can see from this example, there are a number of stabilizing intermolecular interactions at play here, from salt bridges, hydrophobic van der Waal contacts, disulfide bridges between neighboring cysteines, hydrogen bonding, and even water bridges between charged functional groups. As we can see here, there are a number of ways in which secondary structures of helices and pleated sheets can come together, such as a beta coil beta, a series of beta pleated sheets with beta turns to make a Greek key, beta barrels. Basically, if you can imagine it, it probably exists somewhere in nature. Our next and final level of protein structure is the quaternary structure. Now remember, not all proteins will achieve this level of structure, but this occurs when multiple polypeptides assemble through non-covalent interactions to form the final active structure of the protein. A textbook example of this is the formation of hemoglobin, which is a tetramer of four subunits. We will spend a few days talking about hemoglobin in more detail. Now, you may be asking yourself why. Why would a cell not just make one long polypeptide chain to form the entire protein? Why rely on synthesizing multiple chains and then rely on that they will assemble together correctly? Well, there are actually two reasons why. This process first reduces the risk of mutations. For instance, each subunit of hemoglobin is around 141 to 146 residues long. If we were to code for the entire protein in one strand of messenger RNA, that would require 1,722 nucleotides at three nucleotides per amino acid. That is one long piece of fragile RNA that has to be correctly synthesized through transcription from DNA and travel out of the nucleus into the cytosol and then be correctly translated by a ribosome. 
By dividing it into four different messenger RNAs at about 430 nucleotides in length, we have a much more manageable task. In terms of DNA replication and RNA transcription, separating the protein into four different peptides can also reduce the impact of possible genetic mutations in the DNA code. Another interesting advantage to using the subunit approach is in terms of allosteric regulation of enzymes and common metabolic pathways, which we'll explore in more depth in the next unit on myoglobin and hemoglobin. So I want to stop here for now, but remember we will revisit quaternary structure in more depth in our next unit on hemoglobin, and do not forget to post your muddiest point questions on the discussion board for this unit. Again, we're spending two class meetings on activities related to this chapter, but there is only one lecture video and therefore you are only required to post one question answer on the discussion board. So I will see you guys later.